Library of Life by Lena Ng. Many years ago, when Lisette was still a child, her grandfather, a kindly, spindly man with a neatly trimmed beard, had taken her to the opening of the Library of Life. It was a project decades in the making, the announcement of the venture made when her grandfather himself was still a young man. Through an extraordinary twist of good fortune, greased by a convoluted web of trades and favors, Lisette's grandfather had managed to wrangle two rare tickets, the invitations printed on parchment paper of luscious green leaf, a gold microchip attached to its center. The chief librarian, stout as an egg on legs, waddled to the podium in front of the library's double doors. He stepped onto a stool and adjusted the microphone on his starched polka-dotted shirt. Today we are making history, the librarian began in a lively, lilting voice, the fulfillment of a lifelong collective dream. In here, the new library of life, death has no dominion. We will have the memory of life, all life. During the enthralled applause, the librarian threw open the rosewood doors, adorned with carvings of woodland creatures, the borders inlaid with mother of pearl. A collective gasp sounded as the lucky fifty streamed into the circular room, the doors sensors scanning each microchipped invitation. In the center of the floor was the trunk of an ancient sequoia tree, larger and older than the oldest tree we have now. Small vines twisted and entwined around the main trunk, which split into three branches, labeled with calligraphy, burned into the wooden placard, Archaea, Bacteria, and Eukarya, the three main domains categorizing life. From these three main branches, came further and further, divides into narrow and narrower branches, into kingdoms, phylums, classes, and so on, all the way down to individual species, marked by tiny labels with flowing copper plate written in gold. The branches, whose tiny leaves jostled in the climate-controlled breeze, traveled across the expanse of the library's domed ceiling, Lisette squeezed her grandfather's hand as holograms of birds fluttered and hid in the life tree's branches. The birds came from vanished species, such as the Peruvian scale-throated earth creeper, the cabale black-ground thrush, the miravelle's hummingbird, whose iridescent wings shimmered under the LED lights. Birdsong not heard in a century mingled with the chuckling of the laughing owl of the beat of the caribou, white-bellied woodpecker, and the squawk of the Carolina parakeet, a vibrant bird hunted to extinction for feathers to adorn women's hats. The library shelves held jeweled, clam-shell cases, a vivid illustration of individual species on the front. Inside was a data sheet with the species classification some facts about its life and, if available, a DNA sequence with a small tube of bone marrow, scrapings, or a patch of skin. From this sample, a living creature could be grown or cloned, skeletons 3D printed, clusters of cells cultivated. The librarian pointed to each section of the library for plants, animals, and microbes. He described how if a new planet with Earth-like conditions were found, the library would have all the ingredients for life, from plant seeds to animals, even microscopic bacteria. The librarian blew into a reed-like silver whistle, which hung around his neck. And what could this be? Not a hologram, but a living, breathing bird, bigger than a turkey, with a similar sturdy body, promenaded from the back. It bobbed its weighty beak gave a guttural caw, and stroked the side of its heavy head on the back of the librarian's trousers. 
librarian scratched the feathered head. Meet the dodo, a flightless bird which used to gamble on the tropical islands of Mariki, where Lisette's grandparents were born. In the Indian Ocean, gentle yet too trusting, eaten by explorers into extinction less than a century after its discovery. As the first species destroyed by man, it seemed fitting as the first species saved, cloned from the bone marrow of a specimen resting at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. He sounded the whistle again, and out paraded more live animals, the quagga, with the head of a zebra and the body of a horse, and a Pyrenean ibex with ringed, curling horns. Dawdling in the back trudged a Pinta Island tortoise, an ancestor to the last of its kind, Lonesome George, who died in 2012. A lost menagerie brought back to life from fading photographs and remnants of bone. Lucette ruffled the mane of the quagga while her grandfather gently patted its rump. As the astounded crowd gathered around the animals, the librarian continued to point out resurrected wonders. The St. Helena olive, the Sarawak mango, the royal Sanean tree from Hawaii, growing in clay pots in the library's perimeter. Finally, the librarian held up his hands to the murmuring crowd. Despite all the work assembling our current collection, the Library of Life is now undergoing its biggest challenge. We invite the public from all parts of society to be memorialized. Princesses and paupers, billionaires and beggars, athletes and amblers, everyone is welcome. Anyone who wishes for a part of themselves to live forever. Lisette's grandfather snapped his hand into the air. If I submit a sample, would I be cloned? The chief librarian scratched his ample chin. Clo could you be cloned? In theory, yes. Would you be cloned? No, and for many reasons. A clone may look like you, but at the same time wouldn't be you. Just as a twin is a sibling and not a copy, nature provides the DNA, but nurture shapes it. Your clone would live in a different environment and time, and would be his own person. As Lisette's grandfather's look of disappointment, the librarian continued, A hologram would be created that would simulate your personality, however. Your consciousness, your memories, would be uploaded and used to animate your hologram. Again, it wouldn't be you, but it would be an identical simulation, just like the hologram birds flying overhead. Lisette's grandfather's eyes twinkled as he was the first in line to register. Many years later, after Lisette had two children of her own, they went as a family for the first time to the Library of Life. Overhead, hologram birds chuckled and chirped. The chief librarian, thinner and frailer, remembered Lisette as a child with a shining smile. He led them into a velvet carpeted room. Lisette tapped a name onto the glass screen with dates bracketing his life. In the middle of the room, a hologram flickered into view. Lisette gave her shining child smile. Noah and Noel, I would like you to meet your great-grandfather. A kindly spindly hologram with a neatly trimmed beard smiled back. Hello, and welcome to Utopia Science Fiction's first podcast. I am Tristan Everts, I'm the chief editor, and I'm joined today with our design editor, Jonathan S., and he's the person who works on the formatting and provides us some of the art, some of the great, wonderful art that is in our magazine. Now, today's topic is 
what makes a good utopian society and what makes a good utopian story. So we'll start off with what makes a good utopian story. So Jonathan, what do you think makes a good utopian story? I think what makes uh, good utopian stories is willing to have a willingness to have a little bit of darkness in with your optimism. A project that I'm working on now has a society that I think could qualify as utopian, even though they don't necessarily share things that I would approve of in my government, for example. It is ruled by an emperor. It's a lifetime appointment. Serious checks and balances in place so that it's not completely autocratic and it's not completely democratic. That's interesting. I do like the idea about, you know, writing things that you may not necessarily agree with yourself in these utopias. So I think um, there's definitely a thin line between what makes a utopian and what makes a dystopian. And a lot of times you see stories that are combinations of the two. A lot of times you see dystopians disguised as utopias. But I think what makes a what sets them apart is where the conflict is taking place. And I think that in a utopia, the conflict is usually external. How do you deal with an external conflict? And dystopia is how do you deal with a conflict that is the society itself? I think that if you focus too much on external conflict, it sort of comes across as you ignoring some of the flaws that might be within in within a utopian society. So this is my like very quick fact about utopia. Utopia was invented as an idea by Thomas More um, in the late mid 16th century. So utopia comes from the Greek words. There are two words and one of them is utopos, which is no place. And the other one is utopos, which is good place. And so there's this kind of tongue in cheek going on. Yeah, no good place goes unpunished. <laughs> Absolutely. And middle known is Thomas More's uh, cousin, Thomas Less, who accomplished not quite as much. <laughs> that's the that's as far as we go for comedy, folks. <laughs> The great comic moment done, come and gone. <laughs> Writing utopia is definitely a challenge. Oh, yeah. In Sir Thomas More's um, utopia, which is actually a satire, so I'm not sure if I want to count it as a utopia, it has things like slavery and things like death punishments. Yeah, I would not consider that to be utopian at all. The first utopia that was ever written comes from Plato's Republic, and that one wasn't much better. That one had its own problems. And it's really interesting because the way they enforce this perfect society is very harsh. And that's what reminds me of um, what you were talking about, kind of the balance between autocrat and democrat. You had this balance between extreme measures and perfect society, or functionally good society. I sort of approached because uh, shows like Star Wars and Star Trek tend to paint empires as pure evil half the time, and the truth is much more complicated. So I'm sort of aiming to do an idealized version of an empire rather than a perfect empire or even an evil one. Though they were evil in the past. I think that conflict is really, you know, that important thing. How do you do conflict in a utopian society? How do you add that drama in a world that's supposed to be perfect? You basically go, it's not perfect, it's just better than what we have. Yeah, a version of perfect, I think, is perhaps the best phrase to use. Where it may not be, you know, all of our ideas of perfect but we've exactly. overcome, we're better than we are. So here's the question for you. What are the marks of a utopian society? Well, for me, at least, a much more fair society, one that you don't get special treatment because of X, Y, and Z, and you don't get more severely punished because you 
are X, Y, or Z. If that makes any sense at all. Oh, absolutely. I'd agree. That's definitely a mark of a utopian society. It's a society that is fair, treats all people equally, regardless of social status or economic status. Yeah, and one that is willing to provide at least some of the basic necessities. Things like food, medicine, shelter. Irving Berlin on the radio every single day. <laughs> I think also less violent approach, non-violent approach. They try to avoid war and senseless killing. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. How does a utopian society interact with the world around it? Um, treat it with respect. And respect it even outsiders to that society. I think that in Thomas Moore's um, Utopia, there was something like that, where, you know, the only people they didn't like were atheists, but they still accepted them in the empire. They didn't put them to death for believing or for not believing in certain things. Um, and that's really a mark of the time, the time when this was wrote, when religion had a really great importance. And it's uh, kind of understandable things that Europe unified after the fall of Rome. I think one of the key things for a utopia is going beyond just tolerating something, but accepting something. And I think I'm thinking in particular of Star Trek, The Next Generation, uh, which is probably of all the Star Treks that have ever been written, is the closest to a utopian society. But in that, they don't just tolerate people's differences, they accept those differences. And that kind of mentality, acceptance of other things outside yourself, I think is really a big mark in utopian uh, fiction, utopia society. I would agree with that. Uh, I think a lot of the early Next Generation stuff had what was called the Roddenberry Box, the idea that uh, there couldn't be like a violent or even just a heated disagreement, let alone one that might devolve into a shouting match between characters. He was adamantly against that. Do you think that helped to create a utopian atmosphere, or did it hinder it? I'd say it hindered it. Um, in part because you know, that doesn't really make for good um, television, for one thing when all of your characters are perfectly in sync with each other, it becomes uninteresting. And I think that that is a problem that most people who try to write utopias suffer through. They, they hit that wall at some point in time where they think, utopia, how can there be drama? How can there be conflict if everyone agrees in this perfect society? And that's why I um, frankly prefer characters who don't agree with each other. Yeah, I think that even in a utopian society, there's still some kind of, there can still be internal conflict. And what makes a utopian society, I'm going to venture, is how you go about dealing with that conflict versus not having that conflict at all. I think the conflict can still be there. But in a utopian society, we're able to deal with it in a, eventually in a productive manner. Yeah. One of the best episodes of the original series was um, Conscience of the King. And Kirk definitely is not above getting revenge. He definitely wants it, but it's his willingness to do the right thing that keeps him from basically strangling Coridian with his bare hands. And I think that's a better vision of utopia than he never had those feelings of vengeance because he's more evolved human. That is very true. So if our, if our uh, listeners haven't taken this away yet, we're both big Star Trek fans. <laughs> <laughs> In a utopian story, society is at a stable point, and you have to work within that stable point to bring up drama. But it still happens. There's still conflict. Things still go wrong. Uh, your mention of Captain Kirk 
people still have these thoughts that are base, violence, vengeance. And we may never as a species be able to deal with that, get rid of it, but we can deal with it more productively. We can deal with it in a mature way. And that's kind of the challenge, I think, that most utopians navigate in between. I do think, though, that I think I've heard some people discussing uh, Star Trek Discovery as being a dystopia. I'm not sure I agree with that. I think it is still very much a utopia, but it handles the darkness growing within the utopian federation in a way that I think today's audience really needs to hear that it's not just going to be better. It has to be made better through our actions. Do you think that utopia has a purpose in society now? Do you think that it's important to keep writing utopian stories? Absolutely. The first month of 2020 has had so many terrible events, mm -hmm. and I think we need to have some sense of hope put into our fiction, especially now. Definitely. So maybe, maybe a utopian story is nothing more than the capturing and the expression of hope. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And I'm afraid that is all the time we have left for today. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the Utopian Science Fiction Podcast. To learn more about us, please visit our website at www.utopiasciencefiction.com. And if you are looking for a way to support us, please consider donating to our magazine by clicking the Donate button on our homepage, or pick up a copy of our latest issue underneath the Current Issues tab. Your patronage makes a difference. For those who have supported our magazine, Thank you. Now, dear listener, dear reader, until we meet again, let us remember the bold refrain. Let us push onward, ever onward, onward through the impossible. <laughs>